Hi, I'm Nick Sonnenberg. I'm the author of the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Come Up For Air, and the CEO of Leverage, a operational efficiency training consulting firm. My mission in life is to help save you and the world millions and millions of hours uh, by becoming more efficient, not just on an individual basis, but for an entire team or, or organization. On today's episode, we cover a lot, including a framework so that every person on your team can save over a full business day a week. We cover why your mess might be good for you as an individual, but it might not make your team very efficient. And then we are also covering, you know, this whole concept of a Swiss army knife. And would you rather chop down a tree with a Swiss army knife or a chainsaw? And in your business, what tools are you using as Swiss army knives versus what would be the chainsaws? So stay tuned and buckle up because this was a very, very fascinating episode. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. I'm your host, Dolph Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. All right. Maybe in this post-pandemic world, you are struggling to cope. You're not on your own. Maybe you've got more remote people than you've ever thought you would ever have to deal with. And you've been given this laundry list of tools like apps like Slack and Asana and all kinds of other ones to assist you. And the only problem is that they add to the overwhelm. So how do you know what's best for you? And how do you run a high performance remote team using some of those skills, some of those techniques, some of those apps? Do you have the infrastructure for a high performance organization? You know, there's a lot of talk about 10xing your business, but for most businesses, 2xing them would just crush them. You see, with all that, maybe you sometimes feel like your business needs CPR. But what if there was an employee manual that would lay out the exact steps that you need in order to make your business and yourself and your team more efficient and more effective? Well, that's the intriguing road we're going down for the next two episodes with our guest, Nick Sonnenberg. He is going to be speaking to us about how we can all come up for air. For air. Ever feel like that? <gasps> Just wish I could come up for air. Well, he's going to talk about that. More about that in a moment. As always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please do us a favor. Go over to wherever it is that you tune into the podcast from and let us let us know that you're enjoying the show. Do that by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. Hit that subscribe button. It is really important to us. If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. All right. Let's dive right in. Our guest for the next two episodes, as I said, is Nick Sonnenberg. Nick is a serial entrepreneur, Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and guest lecturer at Columbia University. He is the founder and CEO of Leverage, a leading operational efficiency consultancy. Nick has revolutionized business productivity with his innovative CPR business efficiency framework, which is outlined in his book come up for air. For eight years, he was a high-frequency trader on Wall Street. Nick's unique perspective on time, efficiency, and automation have helped companies of all sizes and industries achieve greater output, less stress, and happier employees. By utilizing the right tools in the right way and at the right time, Nick's CPR business efficiency framework has been um, shown to unlock, and wait for this, this is, I read this is amazing, unlock an additional full day of productivity per week, 
per person. You get that? That's pretty wild. Nick and his team have partnered with high growth startups, Fortune 10 organizations, and companies like Poopery, Poopery, rather. You remember Poopery, those great ads? Tony Robbins and even Ethereum. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome the efficiency savant, Nick Soderberg. And the crowd goes wild right now. <laughs> Great introduction. Good to have you here, mate. Really do appreciate it. I know you're a busy lad. We were just talking about that before you came on the air. You've got a lot of running around to do. We appreciate you fitting us in and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us. But where we always like to start, yes, efficiency is important. And yes, we've got to have the right strategies and all those things are important. But for me, it seems like too many people go into business for the wrong reasons and they don't realize till later. And then for me, it's all about meaning. What is the origin story of what gives your life meaning? What is the fuel in that engine? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I guess I'll go, I'll, I'll give you an extended origin story. So if I, if I want to bring it back to the to kind of the very beginning of my um, entrepreneurial journey, about I don't know, close to 15 years ago, I was doing a trip to the Turks and Caicos with a group of friends. And at that point, I was a high frequency trader, as you mentioned. So I was developing algorithms, coding computers to trade stocks at microsecond speeds, uh, trying to capture fractions of a penny, purely based off of math, knew nothing about the companies. And so I had a pretty cool job. You know, I'm like, starting at 23, you know, I had 16 computer screens and had billions of dollars that I was controlling and, you know, kind of able to do whatever I wanted so long as I made money. So Are you I always, a math freak? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a one trick pony is the way I like to, to say it. Okay, yeah. uh, strong at math, not strong at a lot of other things. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm a mathematician by background. And so I always thought I had the coolest job and we were on this trip and my friend was working uh, on his laptop by the pool, drinking a pina colada. And I didn't know at that point it was even possible to work remotely or what it meant to be an entrepreneur. And so I was, I was asking him about like what he was doing. And it clicked for me in that moment that actually I didn't have the best, the, the coolest, best job. I had a, I was, don't get me wrong. I was very grateful for my opportunity, but I, in that moment, I realized, well, what are we optimizing for? You know, is it wealth or money or is it ultimately for me, I realized I was, I wanted to optimize for freedom, freedom of time, freedom of being able to work when I want, wherever I want, with who I want, on what I want. And even though I really loved my job, I, I didn't have all the different dimensions of freedom, right? I had to go to an office. I had to be there during certain hours. I you know, had to work with, the, with a certain number of people. I was like, man, it would be pretty cool to, ha to have an idea and just be able to kind of travel the world and, and work, you know, wherever and whenever. And so that stuck in my head. And eventually when I was around 30, I quit high frequency trading to get into startups. Mm. And, and um, about a year in, I was having dinner with uh, one of my best friends at the time. And I was working on an app. He had his own thing. And we came up with, with an idea for a freelancer marketplace. And I was like, this is pretty cool. You know, we came up with a pretty unique business model. And I said, look, why don't you go and get like five clients? I'll build the back end. We do that tomorrow. This was a Sunday. On Tuesday, let's launch this thing. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. And, you know, I, I, I developed a really simple back end. He got five clients. Fast forward a month, we're, we're the day three speaker at a conference where uh, day two was Tony Robbins. And we closed basically the entire room. Uh, we got them all basically to sign up. It was it was pretty remarkable. So within wow. a month, we're up and running and have about 100 clients. Fast forward about a year, I've got about 150 team members, contractors on the team. Uh, we're doing seven figures of revenue, bootstrapped. You know, and you know, I did a lot of automation, a lot of interesting stuff. And so that all sounds interesting. But under the hood, we had a lot of problems. For example, oh. we grew very quickly, but I was losing about half a million dollars a year in, in losses. We had about three quarters of a million dollars of debt. 
uh, we were gaining about 20% new clients every month, but we were losing 15%. So net, it was only growth. So it was good marketing masking a broken product. And out of about 500 clients and 150 team members, less than say half a dozen, even probably realistically knew who I was because he was, my business partner was the people facing person. I was the non people facing person. Right. So the first moment was this pina colada moment, I like to call it. And then you fast forward and I kind of go on this entrepreneurial journey. And it takes me to this moment where I'm having coffee with, with um, my, my business partner at the time. And he taps me on the shoulder and he tells me he's leaving. Not in two weeks or two days. He's le- leaving literally in two minutes. And I'm like going white and sweating. I'm like, holy crap, we're going to go bankrupt. Like no one yeah. knew who I was. We were losing all this money. We had all this debt. You know, we were doing some things right. Like, you know, we were a remote company with an org chart of two and managing 150 people, but we weren't doing it efficiently and we had a lot of holes in the business. And so at that moment, I had to make a decision. Do I bankrupt the company and just walk away? Or do I try to renavigate the, sh- the ship? Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, I decided to stick it out. There was a lot of positive things under the hood. I didn't want to screw up, screw the three quarters of a million dollars of credits owed to people I literally knew and uh, mm-hmm. some of which I knew, a lot I didn't know. But um, ultimately, I started realizing what we needed to do to turn this around. And I started realizing there was kind of some core areas that we were really weak that needed to be rapidly addressed. For example, it was hard to get any meaningful work done because it was just nonstop blasts and pings and dings and communication tools, right? So have you ever been there there where it's just, you just can't get ahead of it. It's just like right after you get an email, now it's a text. After the text, it's a Slack. And like, you're not getting any work done because it's just like ding, 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 ding. So I realized I had to solve that problem. Right. Next, I realized I actually didn't have a grip on who was working on what. I couldn't just click a button and know, you know, what's Dove working on this week? What's mm-hmm. what's Samantha doing? What's the status of her project? What's Andrew? Did, did Andrew finish all the stuff I asked him to finish? You know, you I would have to go and like ask all these people. I couldn't just click yeah. a button or see a dashboard and right. just know these things that are pretty basic. You know, it's not, it's not like something out of left field, whether you're a financial advisor, whether you're a thought leader or fortune 10, like you need to get a grip on how you communicate. You need to have a grip on what your team's working on and the status of all that work. And then lastly, I, I knew that we had to have kind of a central repository of all of our knowledge, our SOPs, our processes, what I call resources. And so I started really focusing on these three key areas, how we communicated, how we planned, and then our resources. And that was really without realizing it, the genesis of this framework that you mentioned, CPR, mm-hmm. the Cape Plan mm-hmm. and Resource. And I started seeing things rapidly turn around. We started really getting ourselves out of the hole quite quickly. And, and back then we were a freelancer marketplace. So we were doing tasks and projects for clients. We were not what we are today, which is an operational efficiency training consulting company. No. But this framework started turning us around and then people started reaching out to me asking me to consult them on their operations. And so you had mentioned a few like Poopery or Tony Robbins and we had small big companies. And so on the side while I'm fixing my company I started advising these other companies on their internal efficiency and what I realized uh Dove is it didn't matter if you were the world's number one thought leader or a poop spray company or a financial advisor, every single company, regardless of size or industry, needed to communicate with people. They had a team to communicate with. They had clients or vendors they needed to communicate with. Everyone had tasks and projects. They needed, that's the planning part. Mm-hmm. And everyone had knowledge. Everyone has a process for how they do payroll. They have core yep. values, which need to be, everyone had these three buckets. And so Ultimately, I saw the impact. I started seeing that extra business day a week per employee inside of the company. And I, I decided to ultimately make this my life's purpose. I, my mission is to save millions of hours of people's time. And I don't want anyone to drown in work like I firsthand experienced in those, in those months. And so I've kind of made it my life's work to create and help advise and create 
intellectual property and best practices around how teams and organizations can be as productive as possible and leverage all the different technologies available to be the highest performing team possible. But in that moment when your partner said, I'm gone, what was the, I mean, like you said, you started to sweat, but what was the, didn't you feel like you were going to be crushed by that, that moment of, oh. Oh, you, you you know, it's like a, it's like an out of body experience. It's like, is this real? And you have to like kind of pinch yourself. Am I dreaming? Am I not dreaming? Right. Yeah. And, you know, in my situation, it was extreme. Like literally no one knew who I was. So no. it was, it was tough. It was a really, you know, like I, bank accounts were getting frozen. I cashed out my 401k. My dad had to take a second mortgage out on, on his house to help me make payroll. I mean, wow. it, you know, some people complain about having to move into the basement of their parents, try driving them to a bank to take a second mortgage on the house. I mean, it was it was not a fun time. But yeah, I mean, you had to put everything on the line, in, including what was not yours. And I think that that emotional weight, well, aside from the people who've invested and and the people who you've known inside the business, but that emotional weight of, hey, I just drove my dad to the bank to get a second mortgage. Jeez, man. Well, you know, Tony has a great, I don't know if he, were, if he created it or he probably got it from somewhere, but you know, if you want to take the island, you got to, you have to burn the boats. Like sometime, yeah. sometimes, sometimes I'm grateful for having gone through that. Had I not gone through such an extreme situation, I would probably still be running a freelancer marketplace and would not have a book on this topic or a business model that is now my life's purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's in these extreme environments where you know it kind of forces you to think outside the box and figure figure things out and i think that's uh, absolutely true you know, what's that what's that other quote you know you never want to miss a, a great crisis a lot of people use yeah. that during the pandemic yeah. well this this was my great crisis that i didn't want to waste no you know many people uh certainly now i talk about it in the intro uh, are in overwhelm and they realize they're in overwhelm um, but you discovered that that was not a shortage of time or resources, but due to an accumulation of all these, uh, these small inefficiencies in the process. And that is, that's what led you to these core principles for come up for error. Is that right? Well, I mean, I was drowning in work myself while trying to fix this company and you know, I was working crazy hours and it was like, man. You ever you ever get to the end of the week? It's like, man, if I just had like one more day, yeah, I'd just be able to really make some progress here. Yeah. You know, we all feel that, and especially when you're in a moment of chaos, you know, it's it's really a lot of times you have a pretty good idea of what needs to get done, and you know, you know how to do it and what to do. It's just like you just need more time. Uh, oftentimes, <laughs> no pun intended. So. I really re started realizing that in order for me to fix this, the, the biggest constraint is my time and my energy. Yes. And if I can free up as much time on wasted crap that doesn't give me joy or tap into my unique superpower, my unique superpower, you know, if I could get rid of all that stuff through various things, maybe it's through delegation, maybe it's through automation, maybe it's through removing the scavenger, reducing the scavenger hunt and not taking an hour to find a document and giving people a better framework where to put things so it's easier to find whatever it is i don't care time is time so i realized during that moment and i've always been obsessed with time so it wasn't just in that moment but i really doubled down on it and like how do i free up as much time as possible the only way i'm going to be able to solve this is with more time here so let, let's talk about the core principles in the book come up yeah. for a uh... Because as I said, I think most people are in some kind of overwhelm and feeling like they're going to drown. So, you know, and I know that the book is based on very specific principles. So let's talk about what they are and what they mean to, to the leaders who are listening. Sure. Um, you know, in the book, I do address various tools, but I'm not a book on tools. This is not a user manual for Slack, right? No. I want this book to be timeless, kind of like how David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, is a classic on personal productivity. 
I wanted to really create a foundation and be known for helping build that foundation for how teams can be productive instead of just individuals. Mm-hmm. And so everything, you know, also being a mathematician, like a lot of the way I think is just what are the first principles here? Um, mm. The number one principle, what I realized, what if you want to have a high performing team, you have to change what you're optimizing for. And it's tricky. When when people are drowning in work, which everyone is, and you're you're stuck in kind of quicksand, a common just piece of human nature is just to get things off your plate as fast as possible because you're desperate. When you're desperate, it's just like, here, take it. Mm. Uh, it could be a text. It could be an email, whatever. You're just trying to get things off your plate playing this hot potato game mm-hmm. because there's literally just not enough time in the day to get everything done. So it's just like, get it done and move on. You're optimizing for yourself in that moment. You're trying to cut a few seconds yes. off here or there, right? So I call that optimizing for transferring information. Yes. And that's best for the individual, but it's not necessarily what's best for the organization. If you want to be a high-performing organization or team, you have to have everyone, all the individuals, shift the mindset from optimizing for transferring stuff to optimizing for retrieving information, which means that everyone needs to take pause, invest an extra five seconds, 10 seconds to put that document in the right drawer or that task in the right drawer. What Every piece of information or every, every piece of communication, anything inside your company has a specific drawer that's the most logical, best drawer for that thing to live. Now, whether your company has established a framework or policy around that, that's another thing. And that's the purpose of my CPR framework. It guides you into what are the drawers you need. Mm -hmm. And that's a big piece of what we do at Leverage. But for everything, it could be edit this podcast. You know, where's the best place to tell someone and for that to be stored? Um, Could be, you know, where are our core values? Where's the best place for that to be stored? So everything does have an optimal home or drawer for it to live in. And if you can align your team on, on what are the different drawers and you give them a, an, a, a way of thinking about the needs of these drawers and, and everyone's bought into this principle where we're optimizing for retrieval, not for transfer. We all have a mutual agreement as being part of this team where we're all going to take pause an extra five, 10 seconds, and we're going to put things in the drawer it belongs. Because what goes around comes around. And by taking pause and putting it in the right drawer, you might save an hour in a month from now when you need to find it. And maybe it's not you saving time to find that, but maybe, you know, maybe Jim in three weeks needs to find it. And you just help Jim find it 30 minutes faster. Mm -hmm. So you just help Jim, but if Jim's doing the same for you, what goes around comes around. And so it's it's a funny thing because when you're overwhelmed and you're drowning in work, telling someone to take an extra five seconds is a big ask. But I promise you, we see hours and hours and sometimes more than a day back per person when you can remove the scavenger hunt. And it's not rocket science and stuff. So, so let's go to that for a minute because <clears throat> you just said something that I'm going to push back on just because I think it's important for people to understand putting things in the most logical place. Now, <laughs> logic logic may be objective, but there is something called subjective logic, and it makes sense to me to put this here. And uh, yeah, if my wife comes into my office and looks at my desk, she's like, I don't know where anything is. If I go into her office, I'm like, I don't know where anything is. Mine is messy. And I like it that way. And I know exactly where everything is. Um, and if you say, where is it? Like, oh, it's here. And she goes, How the hell do you even know it's there? It's the, I know where it is. If I go in hers, I can't find anything because it's all clean and tidy. And I'm like, it could be anywhere. And that's just an example of, uh, obviously, it's not the overall, but it's an example of that we all have this personal idea of the logical place. And then in a team, we're not all in that. So how do we get around that challenge? Well let's try to say it this way but instead of using you're an idiot office, dove try it this way no. <laughs> how do i say it in a way that you're gonna understand no <laughs> can i say this like you're thick yeah 
I would say it uh, so like a five-year-old could even understand. No. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, let's take, for example, like a chest of drawers versus that, right? Now, mm -hmm. if it's just your clothes, who cares? Like put it, put things in whatever is the most logical for you. If you have to share that chest of drawers with three different people and you sh all share t-shirts and sh socks and, and shorts, et cetera, then you need to align on some type of framework, right? Because it's more of a team effort, right? So everything that I'm about is, is more on the team effort side. But let's just take, let's just extend this chest of drawers example, right? Let's say you're scrapped for time. The fastest way to be done with your laundry would be you take it out of the dryer and you just throw it all into like one drawer. You don't separate it. It's just like you throw it and you slam the drawer shut and you're done. Regardless if you're sharing it with, a group of people or not. Yep. But most likely, even if you have some different, maybe you like to mix your socks and underwear in one drawer. Maybe you like to put short sleeve t-shirts in long, whatever it is, you have some way of separating it into some way that works for you so that tomorrow when you need to put an outfit together, it's faster than had you just shoved everything into one drawer. And now you're trying to figure out and separate things. Right. So you need to have a framework, right? And then depending on if it's just you or if you're dealing with people, that kind of guides you to the extent that this framework could just be whatever the hell you want. You could just develop whatever you want. Or if you need to align with people in terms of what that framework looks like and make sure everyone's on the same page, right? So in your example with your wife, if you're not sharing an office and you know where to find everything, then great. If you're right. sharing an office and it's important for others to find things, then you need to sit back and come up with some type of, of framework so that it's great that you know it, but if other people need to find stuff, you know, that's important That's important that they're able to. But that that's the point here is that, that I really wanted to get across is that I think that one of the things that I know that you are a proponent of is this idea of it's not just about your efficiency, as in you, the individual, but that you may feel like you have to make certain sacrifices in order for the team to be more efficient. Is that correct? Yeah. Do I have that? Yeah, no, exactly. So that's another principle. So the first principle, <laughs> back five minutes in this conversation, you would ask, what are some first principles? So first principle, optimize for retrieval of information, not transfer. The second is individual productivity is necessary, but not sufficient for teams to be productive. It requires collaboration, coordination. Sometimes individuals have to sacrifice their own productivity for the greater good of the team. And there's no better example that highlights this then um, are you familiar with the 2004 men's Olympic basketball team? No. All right. Don't follow so, sports. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm not huge into sports, um, but um, there's actually a documentary about the 2008 team called the Redeem Team, and it's called the Redeem Team because 2004 did so badly. So in Ooh. 2004, you had like Carmelo Anthony, I think Tim Duncan, LeBron James, you had Larry Brown, the best coach of all time, arguably, he won an NCAA championship and an NBA championship, right? So you have, you know, all these, what you what I would call individually productive basketball players, like literally yep. the best players on the planet, right? But the teams assembled like two months before the Olympics, they have hardly any practices together, and so all these individually productive, productive people are thrown, thrown onto a team together, and then they're shipped out to, um, to the Olympics, and they get blown out in game one by Puerto Rico by like 17 points, and I think they get the bronze medal in the end. It was like the biggest disappointment in men's Olympic basketball history, right? And it's because they had individuals that were productive, but as a team, they weren't coordinated. Some of these teams they played with, they practice, you know, daily or weekly for years and years and years. They knew they knew the plays. And so it's not enough to, to just be individually productive. It's not enough that, you know, you can say five seconds here and there. You have to be trying to win as a team. And how as a team can we maximize 
the global efficiency. You know, it's back in math, you have the concept of a local optimization and a global optimization. Yes. And it's important that what we're talking about here, we're on the same page. I'm trying to get a global optimization, which might mean that there's cases where you as an individual have to invest an extra minute to do something, but it's for the greater good of the team. And we're asking everyone to do it. And what goes around comes around. And in the end, I can promise you, you can save easily half a day, a day. I've seen literally sometimes two days a week per person. Wow, that's powerful. We're already at the end of part one of the show. That flew, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're already at the end of part one of the show. I want to make sure that everybody knows where they can find out more about you, of course, about your fabulous book, Come Up For Air, and all the other resources. I know you have plenty of those. So would you tell everybody where they can find out more about you, please, Nick? Yeah, sure. So uh, my book, Come Up For Air, we have a website, comeupforair.com. Uh, we have a bunch of free free additional resources that go along with the book and all the information where to buy the book. Um, if you need further help, I have a training and consulting company, getleverage.com, that helps small to large businesses um, get more efficient and do all the training and consulting needed. And I just launched a podcast with our friend Jay Abraham at theoptimizedpodcast.com, where we do live consultations to help businesses unlock their potential. Fabulous. And we'll, of course, make sure that all those links are posted in the show notes so you can find them. Uh, it'll be easy for you to do that. We're going to be back for part two of this delicious conversation with Nick Sonnenberg in just one click. So stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about how you need to maybe look at your efficiency, not just as for yourself, but for the team overall. And how can you come together in the most efficient, effective way. We're going to look more into that in part two of the conversation. And we'll even have a conversation about inbox zero. What does that mean? Ah, you see my inbox? Okay, we're going to be back in one click.